Thanks, Caroline. It's time to pick the brains of fund manager Roger Montgomery on what he thinks about the future of BHPs and Rio's share prices, and we'll find out what companies he likes and what companies he doesn't like at the moment. He joins me in the studio. Hi, mate. Nice to be back, Peter. Nice to see you with long hair. I've never seen you with hair so long. You must be <laughs> short again before too long. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, mate. Um, this BHP and Rio, you've always had views on them. What do you think of them at the moment? Well, the view has always been the same. Yeah. We've never bought it mm. since the inception of the Montgomery Fund yeah. and the Montgomery Private Fund. Yeah. We've Would never you buy resource them. stocks if you liked them? No. So it doesn't suit Oh, no, you. that's not true. No, we have owned, we have owned a couple of gold companies in the past and we've bought and we previously at the very early part of the fund we owned some of the mining services companies yes. and you might remember we made a big song and dance about getting out of those mm. because there was a disaster coming mm. and we're now seeing it so what's actually happening is because of the slowdown in China which is which is quite dramatic yeah. um, what's happening is there's an oversupply of steel mm. so the local government vehicles that are used for the infrastructure uh, they're getting a return of about three percent on the infrastructure that they've built, but they're paying 7% on their debt, so they've got no appetite to build anything. There's a three-year uh, oversupply of residential real estate, mm. uh, and commercial real estate prices have fallen 50%. Yeah. So no one wants any steel. So China's producing about 839 million tonnes of steel every year. Themselves. And yeah. themselves, mm. and they're consuming 728. Mm. So there's 111 million tonnes of steel which has been dumped on the market. Now, we listened into a conference call for ArcelorMittal, which is the largest or one of the largest steel producers in the world. Mm. Their revenue in the last quarter dropped 18% year on year mm. and their EBIT has fallen 36% year on year. Mm. So they're actually, it's tough times for them. They need to cut their costs, don't they? And then just to show you that there's other stuff going on and other impacts, you've obviously got, you've, well, in this week, earlier this week in the United States, we had Alpha Coal, the coking coal mm. manufacturer, uh, producer in, in the United States, yep. filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy mm. because of high leverage, uh, negative free cash flow and a falling commodity price. Mm. Turn to Australia and Brazil and you've got Vale and Fortescue Metals Group, which both have high leverage, falling commodity prices and negative free cash flow. Mm. And in the case of Vale, they actually have another $10 billion to spend for the second half of their S11D project or expansion, mm. uh, and, and they're going to be in dire straits. So, so they, do their troubles help or hinder BHP and Rio? Okay, so Vale, if we look at iron ore, mm. Vale and Fortescue Metals are highly geared mm. and have negative free cash flow. Yeah. But they, because of that high gearing, they've got to pay interest. Yeah. They've still got to pay that interest. Mm. So they are actually incentivised, perversely, mm. to produce more iron ore, even though the price is going down. Yeah. So as supply is unnecessary because we've got this steel glut mm. uh, out of China, they're going to be producing even more iron ore, mm. which is going to push the price even further down, and it's going to be a vicious spiral. I hope what we saw with Alpha doesn't happen in Australia to any of our major producers or marginally profitable producers, yep. um, but that's my concern. So I don't like the outlook for BHP and Rio. I think people who are saying, oh, look, it looks cheap now, it's fallen a lot, mm. uh, there could be a lot worse to come. Remember this, for 40 years before 2004, the iron ore price traded between 10 and 20 US dollars a tonne. Mm. And, but did those companies make profits in those days? Some did, yeah. not many. Okay, good. Let's, this is a, obviously an area that we have to keep... Keep uh, an eye on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's run through some stocks that once upon a time you, you recommended and you probably don't hold well, them. Well, we probably owned them in the past. Yeah. Gr yeah. Green Cross. Yes. Well, we don't own Green Cross and we sold that. We liked it at one stage. We loved it. Yeah. Loved it. And it spiked uh, uh, at that period. Yeah. And what, what actually... went wrong with it? Because, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, it's... But Pet Barn is probably the most well-known People product. know Pet Barn and Green Cross Vets. They'll know the Green Cross Vets because they'll see the green and white sign yeah. everywhere. Um, look, what's happened, I think, is that some key people have left the business mm. and they were talented individuals who founded those individual businesses. Yeah. Green Cross, the veterinary business, um, and, and also Pet Barn. Correct. So those, they've gone. Mm. They've left. And I wonder, it's just a guess, but I wonder whether or not the people that reported to them who were running the individual practices and individual stores aren't happy under the new regime. Yeah. And, and I think... A bit like primary when they first started, they had a lot of problems with their doctors, yeah, didn't they? 
And what happens is obviously when any retail venture expands, mm. um, whenever it expands, you take your best and most profitable likely sites first. Mm. So when you're expanding a retail presence, you say, we're not going to worry about that one, that's more marginal, this one's an obvious winner, let's get that one. Yeah. So you get all the low hanging fruit first. Mm. I would argue they overpaid for Pep Barn, mm. um, quite, quite well overpaid, yeah. um, but initially it looked like the outlook was was great. We made very, very good money from that investment and I'm happy to say we sold it long before the share price declined. We are now looking at it again and working out what's required to get the business back on track mm. because well, you want two things. You want bright prospects and you also want a cheap price. Mm. It looks like it's got the cheap price bit, yeah. but does it have bright prospects? That's what we're trying to analyse. We're going to meet with the company and talk to them about that after the full year results. Let us know when you change your mind. Reject okay. shop. Reject Shop is in the middle of a, uh, a turnaround now mm -hmm. under under um, a, the new strategy. I don't know if you've ever been to a Reject Shop. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Well, they went a bit off the rails for quite a long time after mm -hmm. Barry Saunders left. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result, and Chris Bryce was a great CFO, mm -hmm. um, to run a retailer, you need to have a merchant. You need someone who knows what products people are going to buy. Yeah, I remember, I remember um, um, the guy who um, did Daryl Lee, Jason Lee, said, right. yeah, good, good retailers, stack them high and cut yep. price and all that sort of stuff. They understand yeah, the retail. It's all, about, it's all about being a merchant. You can't, yeah, anyway, so I don't want to say anything negative about Chris Bryce because I think he was a great CFO. Um, the, the problem is, though, when I walked into those stores some years ago, they weren't $9 average basket size. They were selling products of $50, $60, $70, $80. You don't go to the reject shop for that. So they're getting back to basics. They're turning around. They're in blackout at the moment, so we can't speak to them. Yeah. Um, but again, after the full year results, we'll have a chat with them. I'm worried about the Aussie dollar declining further um, yeah. because you know, they've got, cheap, hedges on, dollar, got they? hedges on, but you know, high, you're not good for good importers. Point. JB Hi-Fi. JB Hi-Fi, okay, so JB Hi-Fi has the benefit of the uh, the government incentive, the $20,000. Yeah, correct. Yeah. They're going to benefit from that. Mm. They're benefiting also from the fact that there's there's no deflation or deflation in electronics has stopped and prices are slowly creeping back up. Mm. But you wonder how sensitive consumers are to rising prices for plasma TVs. You know, yeah. if the price goes to, well, they, do they don't need a new TV with the latest technology. They can hang on to the also old the one. The dollar falling, Roger, ultimately is going to affect the input prices. Well, yes, but JB Hi-Fi doesn't buy direct from manufacturers, um, so they're not taking the hit on the currency. Mm. It gets passed through eventually from the importers, mm. but JB Hi-Fi is less prone to that. Mm. Um, can I just say the, the outlook looks like it's improving, but I think it's all in the price. Okay. Yep. Okay. So we're going for companies that you know in the past you've talked about. Is there a couple of companies that you think really look well positioned oh, for think, what we're seeing right now? Yeah. Well, let's put aside the very bleak picture that's painted by iron ore and the outlook for Australia as a result of that, with unemployment rising and so forth. There are businesses that are doing extraordinary, extraordinarily well, and the one that comes to mind is Challenger, mm -hmm. Challenger Financial Group. Mm -hmm. And they sell annuities. Mm -hmm. Now, they've got three levels of growth coming. One is the ageing baby boomers, so the demographic avalanche, uh, what I call the demographic avalanche. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got more people in the age bracket where they're thinking about annuities, so that's your first source of growth. Within that cohort of people, you've got a large group, an even larger group, switching from accumulation phase to pension phase, and you would know about that. Within the pension phase, um, you've only got about 4% uh, annuities only have about 4% market share, mm. and in actual fact, um, David Murray, uh, um, a financial system inquiry, mm. uh, suggested that maybe, maybe, and it hasn't been adopted, but maybe we think about um, mandating the use of annuities uh, in superannuation portfolios. If that was the case, well, who knows how much that would be. But even in the absence of that, you can go from 4% to 15%. And if analysts were to look at that, market they wouldn't... Market share you're talking about. Yeah. Mm. If, if analysts were to look at that, or portfolio share, mm. if analysts were to look at that, they wouldn't have these sort of modest, flat, of modest straight line projections for earnings, that would be exponential because you've got growth within growth within growth mm. and that could be exponential and we think it could be multiples bigger yeah. in 15 or 20 years it's time. Say, I, I can't see growth of people putting all of their retirement money into annuities. But I Neither can, can I. I. I can see some self-managed super fund people maybe putting a 15%. Exactly, or 10% yeah, or 15 For a safe base and, and then paying a little bit. Which is a lot more yeah. than 4%, yeah. right? So you've got, you've got three layers of fantastic okay. growth. And we'll follow that one up. What else do you like? 
Uh, at the moment, uh, there's a business called Icentia. Uh, ISD is the code. It used to be called Me Media Monitors. Media Monitors. You would yeah. know it. You would yeah. know it in. in I was I was monitored by them. Yeah, go on. Right. Yeah. Okay. So what's great about this business? It, it isn't a bargain at the moment. No. Uh, we do own it. We'd love to buy a lot more. We would we would argue. You know, the Montgomery Firm view is we would argue it is arguably one of the best quality companies listed mm. on the Australian stock market. And what they do... It's a big call. It's a big call. It's a small yeah, it's company. It's new too. It's a small... Well, no, it's been around for decades. Listed It's by new it. as a listed company, but it's been around for decades. Some of their customers have been with them for 20 years plus. You know, and in fact, a large proportion of their customers have been with them for more than 11 years. Mm. What they do, and so, so everyone understands, is if I want to follow Peter Switzer, because I'm Peter Switzer and I want to know who's talking about me yeah. in the press and in the media, yeah. you pay them and they give you a sheet to tell you yesterday... Government, all that sort well, of stuff. Yeah, airlines want to know, yeah. you know, if they're playing. But here's the thing, it's all changed. Because of social media, mm. if you're running an airline here in Australia and one of your planes is, you know, the landing gear is broken at the front and it's landed on the front wheel, you don't even know before the world knows because somebody's filming that with their iPhone mm. and on filming that it goes viral and you need to deal with it. So you pay media monitors mm. to track all of the social media mentions of your name as well yeah. and they're earning a lot more from that. So their revenue per customer is going up, mm. their number of customers is going up and they're expanding into Asia. One last question, we are out of time unfortunately. Sorry about that. That's okay. But is it, are they easy to copy? No. Because, they're, because of their reputation mm. and because of the systems that they've got in place and the value that they add for their customers. Mm. If they were easy to replicate, someone would have done it 20 years ago mm. and they haven't done it yet. Mm. All right, mate. Great to see you as always. You too.